the United States of America, the hegemon of the New World, in the period from 1925 to 1936, a dozen years in fact, managed to go quite a strange way. From economic prosperity, boosted by trade with a war in Europe, to its own internal war, the bloodiest war in the history of both Americas, which decided the future course of the country's policies for the coming decades. How did this happen and what did it lead to? My name is Jacob and I welcome you to the Synthetic History channel, where we talk about events that didn't happen as if they did. And today I am going to talk about the Second US Civil War in the Kaiserreich universe. The story of how the United States fell into the Civil War began with World War I, or to be more precise, with its aftermath. As you probably know, as a result of the German and their allies' victory in the war, a series of syndicalist revolutions took place in the defeated countries. The most important of these revolutions was the British Revolution, which ended with the success of the syndicalists, the collapse of the British colonial empire and the so-called troubled mid-twenties, a period of worldwide economic and then political instability associated with the breakdown of global supply chains. Britain owned a quarter of the world back then, after all. The US was pretty much affected by the revolution. Britain accounted for nearly a quarter of its trade, much of it in exports, and Britain had accumulated a lot of credit in American banks during and after the war. For the US market, already oversaturated by the time due to spontaneous industrial growth and competition from a booming German economy, the loss of a major trading partner and borrower was the trigger for the New York stock market crash of April 20th, 1925, and the Great Depression that followed. The Roaring Twenties came to a roaring halt. The disruption of the economy and the dramatic rise in unemployment, which in 1925 was over 20%, gave rise to extreme left and right ideologies. The poor are notoriously more prone to radicalism. The left, inspired by the success of their European comrades, consolidated around the combined syndicates of America, founded on July 12, actually a union of trade unions, which began to gain popularity in the industrial states of the East Coast and the Great Lakes. The right, on the other hand, was concentrated in the Democrat Party and had so far maintained the two-party system that had emerged after the First Civil War. The president who had to face the global crisis and the Great Depression, by the way, was also a Democrat, William Gibbs McAdoo. And it was his failures as president that, in my opinion, were an indirect cause of future events. His list of accomplishments includes violent suppression of protests, an ineffective handling of the economic crisis, and a failed foreign policy. Because of that, the Democrats were crushingly defeated in the next presidential election, in 1928, and Herbert Hoover, a Republican, became president. His presidency was generally better. No. Hoover's economic policies, relying on the development of private infrastructure and lower interest rates on loans, were ineffective. Perhaps his plan would have worked if society had not been so polarized and business amorphous, but the fact remains that his domestic policies made Hoover terribly unpopular. The president refused direct government intervention in the economy. He did not accept the idea that it was the consumers, not the producers, who should be helped. There was plenty of supply from industry, but no demand from the unemployed. And the complete undermining of his popularity came when in 1932 he vetoed the Garner-Wagner bill, the Democrats' project of lending to small business and individuals, the so-called consumer loans. And it would seem that in that case he would simply be defeated in the next election, and the newly elected president would do things the right way. That's how democracy works. Such a president could have been the Democrat senator from Louisiana, a popular and somewhat populist politician named Huey Long. But the Democratic establishment disagreed. 
As a result, Huey was defeated in the primaries and embittered at the existing political system. Two years later, he created his own right-wing party for all good and against all bad. America First Party AFP, taking with him a significant part of the electorate and establishment from the southeast. What happened in the election then? None of the three candidates could get a majority, and the 12th Amendment of the US Constitution gave the power to elect the president to the House of Representatives. And well, they made an ingenious decision. They chose Hoover for a second term. The guy the whole country hated was elected again. And as you can imagine, it did not end well. Hoover's second term was characterized by worsening social problems, a rise in crime, the political crisis of the two-party system, already obvious to contemporaries, and the emergence of left and right-wing paramilitary organizations, as well as major droughts and a series of catastrophic dust storms that severely damaged the central part of the country. So we come to 1936 the year of the new election and the last year of the Hoover's presidency. Congress by the time looked like this. The Socialist Party of America SPA, led by John Reed, a senator from New York State who had gained popularity during Hoover's presidency, and Long's AFP took 40% of the seats. The AFP actually had more support, but because elections are only held for a third of the seats every two years, the full cycle did not make it through. In the North, a considerable number of seats were taken by the Workers' and Farmers' Party of the Social Democrats, not vilified by the failures to fight the crisis. And the year began with the Garner-Wagner bill. Hoover, under pressure from the party, agreed not to veto it in case of a successful vote. Now, however, the project had many opponents in Congress. Both among those who thought it was insufficient, the right and the left who were gaining popularity, and among those who asked, where are we going to get the money for this now? So much for the lesson that everything had to be done in time. The Democrats and the Republicans jointly pushed the bill through Congress, adding federal guarantees for payments to the unemployed, much to the anger of the AFP and the SPA, who wanted the bill to fail to increase their own popularity. In response to the growing radicalism, the Democrats and Republicans agreed to form a coalition for reform and the upcoming presidential election. The nominee of the General National Unity Party was a member of the Labour Farmer Party, Governor Floyd Olson of Minnesota, who had already proven himself with his anti-crisis measures. The vice presidential candidate was Quentin Roosevelt governor of New York and son of President Theodore Roosevelt. Such political nobility. And it would seem that everything was going to improve. The compromise candidate had a good chance of winning, and the market in 10 years was already on demand, which means that the level of radicalism would decrease over time. But then, from the ocean, just in two days, came a new crisis. The collapse of the German market the so-called Black Monday. The German economic mistakes mirrored those of America, but we will talk about this some other time. For the US, this meant a new wave of social tension. Now it was obvious that the sooner to pay the unemployed, the better. The Garner-Wagner bill was passed. Now the question for the government was where to get the money. They couldn't just print it. The gold standard was still in effect, which meant the money had to be found somewhere else. Somewhere else was the corporate income tax, which was promised tax cuts after the crisis, as well as increased custom duties from the countries of the former British Empire, especially Canada, which refused to pay the debts of the metropolis. The proceeds made it possible to create an agency to coordinate aid to business and citizens headquartered in Minneapolis. First and foremost, the money went to help the most depressed regions, namely in the central part of the country. The military factories built there were to create jobs and at the same time give a boost to the modernization of the army. 
For the same purpose, federal contracts for fleet construction were awarded to the ports of Texas. But all these efforts were not enough. And time was also not enough. In the congressional elections, the AFP and the SPA snatched up several more seats. The general level of violence in the country did not diminish, and the police unsuccessfully fought the paramilitary organizations. This was especially felt in the central stripe of the country, where the spheres of influence of both radical parties overlapped, resulting in regular clashes on ideological and racial grounds. This was the environment in which the US was approaching the November presidential election. In that election, as you already realized, none of the three candidates won a majority. Olson was only 4% short. And the new president was again elected by the House of Representatives, in which the last third of the delegates had not yet been re-elected with the AFP and the SPA candidates. And, well, they had no problem electing Olson. Reed and Lon obviously disagreed with this election outcome realizing that they were at the peak of their political power. And not taking this opportunity now would bring everything back to a pre-crisis state. On New Year's Eve, the syndicalists announced a general strike throughout the industrial north. The federal government had to do something. Inaugurated on January 21st, Olson called the country to order and promised to fix the economy, restore national unity and avoid violence by any means necessary. Roosevelt went west, to Seattle, to negotiate with local unions, while the president went to Chicago to negotiate with Reed, against the advice of the party, which had united in the first place to avoid political connections with syndicalists and the military, which feared for his safety. I survived cancer, I'll survive this, was Olson's answer to all those opposed to the idea of negotiations. And there was plenty to negotiate about. The social democrats and the syndicalists had common goals. Only one wanted to humanize capitalism and the other to destroy it. But then Lon, who had no business being here, entered the negotiations. Long and Reed couldn't reach a compromise on all issues, which is not surprising because, you know, left-right, and at the same time surprising, because their election programs matched with 95% accuracy. For example, Long wanted to enforce a cap on income over $5 million and impose an unconditional basic income. All in all, negotiations among the three socialists came to a standstill. Olson's new idea was to negotiate unofficially with each side separately. Because as I said, these guys had a lot in common. They just couldn't stand each other. And perhaps this idea would have succeeded. But the hammer of the military got involved in the delicate subject of politics. On February 8th, the chief of staff General Douglas Goddamn MacArthur, using the support of Olson's cabinet, put him under house arrest, declared himself head of the interim administration and was going to suppress the radicals by force. Reed was the first to react to the news, declaring that he was going to overthrow the two tyrants. The syndicalists of the Steel Belt and New York states quickly disarmed local military bases, seized administrations and blocked roads. Then Long got involved too, saying he was going to overthrow the two tyrants. He was supported by the southern governors. And then the Pacific states broke away from the US, saying that all three men were tyrants and that democracy was being killed in the country. They were backed by the former vice president. MacArthur, seeing all this, gave the separatists an ultimatum to stop this extremism and lay down their arms. The deadline was one month. At the same time, the US Army began to move all the forces and equipment to the East Coast, recruiting volunteers and preparing for the coming war. MacArthur, who had declared himself acting president, by the way, did not want to see territory at all but the other generals were able to change his mind. And the reason for this was clear. 
the American Army itself. Because of its convenient geographic location, the United States almost never needed an army and therefore saved money on it. It was, to put it mildly, in a bad shape. Small personnel, few planes and armored vehicles. There was only one tank division, with 180 light tanks for the whole country. Not to mention, the radical militias had more firearms than the army. The other three sides quickly occupied the vacated territories and, as expected, they did not intend to surrender. The armed forces of the radicals and the western states consisted mainly of militias, while the west also had a substantial portion of its army made up of US army units that had defected to their side. The size of the armies ranged from 150,000 in the PSA to the Federal Army with 270,000, although subsequently all increased their forces. For the Navy, the situation was better for the Federal Government. Most of it went over to MacArthur's side. The radicals were able to seize only a small fraction of the ships, in the ports of Philadelphia and Florida, and a large part of the Pacific Fleet went to the PSA. Nevertheless, the Pacific Fleet was irrelevant to future conflict. With this balance of power and the expiration of the ultimatum, the Second American Civil War began on March 13, 1937. Politicians' words meant nothing anymore. Brother marched on brother, not infrequently literally, and the fate of the country was to be decided on the battlefield. And the war started quite well for the Federals. Being the smallest party to the conflict from a territorial point of view, unlike other factions forced to fight on the wide expanses of the Great Plains, they could easily cover the entire front, which gave them the opportunity to create assemblages of forces for the offensive. And MacArthur's first target was the Syndicalists the most dangerous in terms of ideology and also possessing a powerful steel belt industry. Within days, Philadelphia and New York City were taken without much effort. This gave land access to the northern states, which remained loyal to the government. How did this come about? The point is that the syndicalists had a rather risky plan for men in their eastern front. Most of the militia recruited in New York was to be transported to Philadelphia by sea, using civilian ships, and the rest were to defend the city until the remaining forces arrived. But there were very few of these rest, willing to become possible suicide fighters, so it was decided to abandon the city. But this plan and its route was intercepted by the FBI and the ships with escorts from the syndicalist fleet were met midway. A battle ensued, which led to the virtual elimination of the CSA fleet, and the battered army had to return urgently to New York, where they were already met by the Federal's army. Thus, the Federals greatly weakened the CSA and gained a short-term advantage on the front, as well as the sympathy of the Loyalists. However, it proved impossible to develop the advantage further, mainly because of logistical problems. The army had a severe truck shortage. The offensive had to be halted until fall. In the West at this time, battles were fought with varying success with volunteers and equipment from other countries. The PSA was supported by the Entente countries and Japan, the IOS by Germany, the CSA by Britain and France. Thus, the center of the country became the site of the international battle of ideologies and testing of tactics and weapons. One question is how did the syndicalists get to the CSA? In any case, it was basically a war of militias, armed only with rifles, and as I said, a war on very long fronts. You could say the struggle of three guerrilla armies. It took time to convert the industry to the war track and staff the normal armies. In the meantime, let's go back to the East. In the fall, the Federals, having significantly increased their fleet of trucks, thanks to the concerned civilians, tried to make a breakthrough to Lake Erie, thus hoping to encircle the syndicalist forces, but failed because of the terrain, and retreated. 
the syndicalists launched a counteroffensive, mostly unsuccessful, and the command decided to try their luck in the south, where the AUS, relaxed from the lack of fighting, had left a small force behind. They eventually achieved some success, capturing an important airfield and the capital of North Carolina. And in the winter, the initiative in the north again passed to the federal troops. This time they advanced along the Great Lakes. In January, Buffalo was taken, and the Federals, being backed up by water, were able to surround some of the CSA forces. By the anniversary of the war, they had taken Cleveland. Individual syndicalist units deserted, and either returned home or crossed the border and joined the Federal Army. The front was broken through. Within days, the Federals were already entering the capital of Ohio. By the way, the US was also getting international support. From Cuba, Austria and... Uh, Russia? Well, what can I say? Same energy. After Pittsburgh was taken in April, it was decided to suspend the offensive. Or rather, the syndicalists decided for them. They launched a new counteroffensive. What was happening in the West at this time? The greatest success there was achieved by the PSA, which had only two neighbors and a major support from the Entente countries. But in general, there was a tendency toward a meat race. That is, when instead of qualitative improvements in the army, the sites simply increased its size. The lands of the front only contributed to this. Whoever had a larger army could afford some maneuvers and was therefore stronger. This resulted in huge losses. In one year, more than a million Americans gave their lives in this war. Federal army losses of 76,000 in comparison seemed insignificant. In the summer, federal troops launched two parallel operations. A major encirclement of syndicalist forces and a sudden assault on the weakened AUS. In October, they entered Atlanta and occupied Florida. In November, they surrounded another syndicalist group. Having lost much of their army, they were on the verge of total defeat. Which, in fact, happened. On February 2nd, the Federals entered Chicago. Reed and the rest of the party fled to Britain. The CSA was de facto destroyed. With this success, it became clear to America that victory for the Federals was a matter of time. By this point, their army had received serious reinforcements. Three heavy tank divisions became a punching fist, capable of making breakthrough. Why heavy tanks when the enemy had only small caliber weapons? That was the wish of MacArthur. In April, they made such a breakthrough by encircling AOS troops. The AOS were in the weakest position, and their ideology was weak, too. The PSA troops had split their territory in two, which meant they would take the western part and the Federals would take the eastern part. Uh, no. MacArthur's tanks cut off that Louisiana branch and only then the Feds launched a major offensive against the AOS. But the development of the offensive was hindered by the Entente countries, uh, primarily Canada, entering the war on the side of the PSA. Canada had two reasons for this action. First, who knows what MacArthur would do after the Civil War. And second, PSA promised to help the Entente in the return of the European territories, if they won. Although this posed some problems for the US, because it was necessary to disperse forces for defense, the Canadians hardly attacked, contenting themselves only to create a threat of attack. Already in October, the Federals had restored the offensive in the south, and in the new year, with the fall of the AUS headquarters in Baton Rouge, the organization was destroyed, incidentally also on February 2nd. The Radicals were defeated. Now two sides were left in the Civil War, and in theory they could have reached an agreement. However, neither the PSA, who considered MacArthur a usurper, nor MacArthur, who considered them traitors who had doubled the duration of the war by their actions, wanted this. So the war continued, uh, though not for long. The US Army was bluntly twice as large. 
The Federal tanks made their way south and rounded the mountains and highlands of the west along the border with Mexico, thus making their way to the core of the PSA, California. The tanks entered Los Angeles in March, in April, San Francisco, and the capital, Sacramento. The last PSA stronghold remained Seattle, but it fell in June. Even with the defeat of the Western states, however, Canada was not out of the war. But for the US troops that had gone through the war, the army of the northern neighbor, mostly of whom had already gone to war with the syndicalists, posed no threat. Within a month, they occupied the country's three main cities of Montreal, Ottawa and Toronto, forcing Canada to sign the Montreal Peace Treaty. As a punishment for meddling in US internal affairs, Canada ceded the territories of New Brunswick and New Scotia to the United States. At this point, on July 24, 1940, three and a half years later, the US Civil War was over. About 3 million people died during this time, making it the bloodiest war in the history of the Western Hemisphere. Victory in the war, however, did not mean the complete destruction of the rebels, who were still fighting a guerrilla war, for the main cause of war, General MacArthur, was never eliminated. The fate of the country was in the hands of one man, and he did what many expected him to do but even more did not. He returned power to an elected president. By this action, he effectively turned the PSA into idiots in the eyes of the public. What were they fighting for, then? But who could realistically say, then, that MacArthur would not become the executioner of the republic? And as I said, if MacArthur hadn't gotten into politics, chances were pretty good that there wouldn't have been a civil war. However, there is no way to verify that. MacArthur became a hero. So let's get back to presidents. Because Olson died of cancer at the beginning of the war, and because Roosevelt had become a traitor, until the next election and inauguration, Congress elected a compromise figure as president. The progressivist Alfred Smith. Americans breathed a sigh of relief. This move gave MacArthur, who had become a Republican candidate, enormous popular support, which helped him win a landslide victory in the November election. Now, having a fully legitimate president, the United States had to recover from the Civil War, integrate the rebellious states back into the state, decide what to do with the former Pacific possessions, during the war Hawaii had broken away from the states, and Japan had taken Guam and decide its foreign policy, since a new world war was in full swing. After the Civil War, the United States possessed a powerful military industry, which could be used to restore the economy. It was only necessary to decide whom to help. But this is material for another story. And I would like to end this story here. Leave a comment, like this video and subscribe to the channel if you want to see similar videos in the future. See you in the next story. Jacob was with you, and with that, I say goodbye.